In this class today, we are going to discuss about a very important spectroscopic technique called Raman spectroscopy. And as you know, Raman was an Indian and a lot of important aspects are involved in relating this spectroscopic technique. So, I will be able to do a little bit of justice to this in one hour time, but I do not think it is possible to talk about the details um, of the spectroscopy in just a short span of time, because there are a lot of added theories are uh, needed to be covered in such a class. But I am going to give you some basic idea of the spectroscopic technique, how it can be related to applications and uh, obviously some amount of instrumentations will be dealt with. As you know uh, the, the outline is like this, obviously there will be some aspect of introduction going back to history and uh, some basic features and then I will talk about some basics of the Traman spectroscopy where I will talk about theories and then some amount of scattering and vibrations and finally, some instrumentation for Raman spectroscopy and obviously, in the during the course of the lecture I am going to talk about some examples from the literature and from some of our own work. As far as the basics are concerned, Raman spectroscopy basically probes the vibration modes of material. It is more like an infrared spectroscopy. I have already discussed about infrared spectroscopy in a few classes back and there I showed you by you know theoretical, theoretical presentations that how this IR spectroscopy related to the vibration modes of the molecules. But there is a distinct difference between IR and the Raman spectroscopy. In fact, in IR spectroscopy the bands arises or bands arise from the change in the dipole moment of the molecule, but Raman's bands arise from a change of the polarizability not the change in the dipole moment remember. So, it is the polarizability, polarizability change that is makes Raman's so interesting. So, therefore, if there is a symmetric molecule it will not work that is the most important problem in Raman spectroscopy. In many cases transitions that are allowed Raman's are forbidden in IR. So, there are techniques these two techniques are basically complementary to each other. So, you will see that I will show you comparable spectra of from the Raman and from the IR to show you how these two techniques can be used as complementary. So, therefore, as I said at the, uh, the very basic aspect of the Raman bands arising during measurements is the change in polarizability of the molecule that is basically sets an exclusion rule. What is the exclusion rule? It says if the molecule has a center of symmetry then no modes are is active whatever is a IR Raman. So, as you can look into is this slide it will, it will be clear to you. So, for a molecule with a center of symmetry as I said no IR active tensions are, are Raman actives or vice versa. What is it? Let us suppose this molecule which is uh, COO that is CO2 and uh, you know it is Raman active, but IR inactive, but on the other hand if the molecule has change th that means if this molecule is little bit of you know center of symmetry change little bit this side right side then it becomes Raman active. On the other hand if the molecule become fully center of symmetric then no bands no of none of these techniques can apply. As far as the history is concerned that needs to be told because Shiv Raman was the first Nobel laureate in science obviously the first Nobel laureate from this country is was for literature in 1913. But 1930 Shiv Raman got Nobel prize in physics because of this discovery. If I want to stress back the how this spectroscopic technique or the Raman effect came into picture. First thing we need to understand is the Raman is basically related to inelastic scattering. So, first time inelastic scattering light scattering was predicted by Smekel in 1923 and then after 5 years 1928 Landsberg and Mendelstam see the first unexpected frequency change in the scattering from a quartz that is what this inelastic scattering means actually. Because Elastic scattering was known or even long long back from Raleigh Lord Raleigh's time, but inelastic scattering was not fully understood. So, it was in you know early part of the last century 
20th century these things have started. In 1928 C. V. Raman and one of his students very illustrious students K. S. Krishnan first time while working on different solvents saw feeble fluorescence and it was reported and after within 2 years it was become so uh, you know uh, intense uh, activity Raman was awarded Nobel Prize. To tell you that K. S. Krishnan this is the picture both of them are taken from studyhelpline.net where you can get biodata this is Raman's picture and uh, this is Krishnan just to impress you upon that in those days when India was under British rule still there are scientists who were working on path making research and it was only possible because of these two gentlemen who worked hard to put the things into the world's perspective as far as scientific content is concerned. So and uh, but you know uh, Roman prize was given to C. V. Raman, uh, K. S. Krishnan obviously was his PhD student who worked hard to prove that. So, his contributions were no, nowhere less. So, that is why I wanted to show you and then 1961 laser came and uh, from the measure actually after the second world war and 1977 first time using laser surface ray enhanced Raman scattering was discovered. It is thanks to laser only it was possible to discover that and 1997 that is the big change happened in the Raman spectroscopy another big change when single molecule shows surface enhanced Raman spectros, spectrum or scattering. So, therefore, nowadays we can actually go all the way to the single molecule and get Raman scattering and then probe it using Raman spectroscopic technique. So, that is how it is actually possible as you as you understand talking all this surface and Raman spectroscopy and single molecule Raman surface and Raman spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy is beyond the scope of this course. So, those of you who are really interested or maybe using this technique extensively they can look at different books which I will show you even some of the references while giving the lectures and then understand or try to understand these are very advanced topics not even part of the uh, this course. Well, to show you how the first Raman spectra looked like this is taken from this paper which is published long back ok. You can see this is the spectrum Raman fluorescent spectrum obtained from sil, uh, mercury arc lamp and this one is from benzene ok C686. So, there are distinct bands you can see on a from the photographic plates and these bands actually are related to inelastic scattering molecule. Let us look into the theory in detail that will tell you how the Raman's actually scattering happens and how it can be utilized. If I have to tell you in one sentence Raman's effect is a two photon scattering process it is no longer a single photon scattering process and these processes are all a inelastic scattering type. So, first thing we need to talk about is Stokes scattering and Stokes scattering is always inelastic scattering because energy is lost by the photon. Now, if I have photon in and obviously there is no vibration here and therefore, this photon will be absorbed by the molecule the energy is sufficient enough for it to uh, you know get excited to the excited states and some amount of photon with a less frequency obviously will come out because some amount of has been absorbed that is what is the nature of inelastic scattering you should know that and this will lead to vibrations and these vibrations can lead to fluorescence anti source scatterings energy is gained by the photon instead of loss. So, what happens you have a photon in and there is a vibration and then photon absorbs uh, the, this, this molecule actually absorbs a photon. So, some photon goes out, but you know energy is gained by the photon in this way. So, there will be no vibrations, So there are two kinds of scattering as you see in which one is energy is lost by the photon another energy is gained by the photon and both are inelastic scattering type they are called stokes and anti stokes. Now, there is obviously a dominant scattering process which is elastic scattering. Elastic scattering means there is no energy loss when the photon is absorbed or photon is out and this is what is known by 
name of Lord Rayleigh long back and uh, this is simple energy absorbed, energy goes out. So, in both the cases no vibrations. So, elastic scattering is cannot give this Raman scattering. If incident photon energy E and the, and the vibration energy is uh, V, okay, this is V, so V, then the, in terms of energy we can write it E minus V is a Stokes scattering E plus V anti Stokes scattering and E is the elastic scattering, scattering and these two gives Raman scattering, not the last one. You should know that. These are all been taught for the different set of particles. Now, to talk about more about wireless scattering, this is again taken from Eugene Hecht optics book. So, if I have a molecule, you can see nucleus and the electron cloud there, and certain photon energy comes H nu, and then it get excited ground states to the higher energy state, it goes, I can see that, and then de excitation can always happen. That means the molecule can come back to the original ground state by emission of this photon. This is fine, and you know this can happen in the order of 10 to the minus 8 seconds. So, therefore, elastic scattering basically lambda does not change, the wavelength of vibration does not change. It can have random directional emissions, does not lead to fluorescence, and there will be little energy loss. So, therefore, it is not. And this is what is the basically the scattering energy, where these are the different parameters. The lambda is the d is the energy, e is the energy level, count state, theta is the energy uh, at which it is scattering at the angle. Now, if I want to put it the inelastic scattering into perspectives, so I I can actually make a schematic diagram and show you that. So you know this is what is ground state energy level E zero you can see and then if I have some photon in the wavelength of IR radiations, the energy will be the molecule will be excited to the higher energy level E 0 plus H nu and when it comes Well, this can be also explained using uh, the uh, the photon scattering in in a energy landscape. So, as we see, I have seen that there are two kinds of scattering. One is elastic, other one is Stokes, anti-Stokes, which are basically known as el elastic scattering, and they are related to Raman. So, if I consider E zero as my ground state for the molecule, and this is the vertical axis the energy. So, whenever certain infrared radiation is imposed on this molecule, it will absorb and go to the high energy band that is suppose the excited states and when it comes back, it gave its radiation and that can be detected and that is what is the principle of IR spectroscopy. Now, one can always think the lialis scattering or elastic scattering in this way, we have a high energy H nu zero by which the molecule is goes to the virtual excited states, not the nearest excited state. And when similar amount of energy is released by the molecule, it comes back to the ground states. That is what I have shown you in the last slide here, exactly the same thing. Now, in case of Stokes, suppose molecule is excited to the higher energy state or virtual state by H nu 0 energy level, and there is some inelastic scattering happens some energy get lost, so that it does not come back to the ground state at all. That means, it lost energy, but the molecules can come back 
by losing this energy h nu 0 minus h nu 1 to the excited states and vibration states the above the ground state that is what is this one. So, this is obviously you can see it can flow easily when it comes back to the, uh, the, the ground state. Another situation can happen in anti stoch scattering is that molecule can get excited to the higher energy states than these previously virtual states okay. and when it goes there it gets to these virtual states it gathers more energy maybe it can have H nu 1 extra energy. Okay. So, that total energy of the molecule uh, increased because it absorbed another photon other than H nu 0 and when it comes back to the ground states it just have extra energy which is also coming out H nu plus H nu 0. This can also lead to fluorescence. So, therefore, both stroke scattering and anti scattering can lead to Raman that is what I am saying, but the catch is this the Raman's effect comprises a very small fraction about 1 in those 7 of the incident photons. So, that means we need to have a very good probe to detect the small the number of photons which are actually undergoing this because most of these you know, events will be happening in the real scattering things. Now, if I want to put it in perspectives in front of you if I have molecule energy goes out and energy comes uh, goes in energy comes out. So, that means it gets excited and it gets scattered. So, only you can see that Raman count is only one when that the, the actually the laser actually which is used for the scattering is very high into the 7 counts. So, that means 1 into the 7 photons is scattered in scale. So, almost bulk of the photons get scattered by elastics and they can have you can have different kinds of uh, Raman spectroscopy depending on what kind of you know scattering is what kind of things are happening like rotational states or vibrational states or electronic states in the energy level. To put it in terms of IR and the Raman spectroscopy in IR we have a laser beam certain intensity of the energy of the given frequency is uh, fall uh, uh, put on the sample this one it absorbs and then comes back to ground state releases the energy of different intensity and detector by detector and we get the IR spectrogram spectra. In Raman it is basically not the transmission or absorption it is the scattering. So, laser falls on uh, energy falls on a sample is get scattered because of this you know Raman scattering and Alice scattering this is Raman which is has changed or uh, because of the extra energy or loss of energy and then that is what is detected. So, you have this is the major difference between these two techniques. If I want to put it even much better way Raman scattering sample preparation usually simpler liquid solid sample must be free of dust IR you cannot do that. Biological material which usually flows masking scattering is also possible. So, which is which are not possible in cross IR. Spectral measurements on vibration modes in visible regions glass cells can be used and depolarization studies are easily made the laser radiation is almost totally linearly polarized, but in case of IR halide optics must be used as we have seen they are very expensive can be broken it can be water absorbed also because they do not absorb uh, the basically other than halides most of the material absorb the IR radiation and it is not possible to get a good data. I spectrometers are not usually equipped with polarizers on the other hand round spectrometers are usually equipped with polarizers. How does the Raman spectro spectrum look like? Well, this is what is shown you in terms in, in the picture this is the intensity this is the wave number again centimeter to the per inverse and uh, you know spectrum is nothing but a plot of intensity of the Raman scatter radiation as a function of wave number a frequency difference from the radiation radiations usually in units of wave numbers. So, this difference is called Raman shift incident and the scatter radiation difference and this is for the carbon tetrachloride. So, you can see these are the frequency differences minus and these are the frequency differences plus for the anti stokes and this is the Rayleigh. So, Rayleigh will be the highest peak because this is the elastic scattering on the left of the Rayleigh but less wave numbers will be the stokes on the right side will be anti stokes 
the elastic scatterings, inertia scatterings where energy is lost, energy is gained. So, to let us look into the detailed theory of atomic vibration and Raman scattering, which is can be just uh, helpful as to helpful for us to understand the simple formalisms. Well, as you know, uh, we can always consider a diatomic molecule and with a spring attached to it, bond can be considered to a spring and they are all getting stretched. The spring is getting stretched by mass m1 and m2, spring constant is k. So, if I uh, stretch this molecule, that is what is excitation basically, by x1 amount this side, x2 amount is on the right side of myself. So, I can always write down this is the Fuchs law force law basically m1 m2 divided by m1 plus m2 double derivative of space or the extension with respect to the time is nothing but displaced uh, the sorry is nothing but acceleration or decelerations this is the mass this is basically reduced mass you can say. And uh, that will be related to the, the, uh, the constant k, k is a capital and x1 plus x2. So, therefore, I can write down this in terms of mu d q by d 2 square q by d t square equal to k into q minus this is q is the total displacement. And this can be solved this where v m nu m basically is equal to 1 by pi root k by nu. This is nothing but the frequency of vibrations. So, that is what is the you know whenever a molecule is stretched or excited this is what will happen it will drive it with this and this will be the basically displacement uh, can be related to the vibration this way q equal to q 0 cos of twice pi rho mu m into t. Now, if once you look at it you know in different perspectives suppose this is the molecule which is vibrating as you see last time and this is the the, uh, the change of the distance vibration q and we are putting in certain radiations which is given by this E equal to E 0 cos of 2 pi nu 0 t. So, therefore, this will lead to an dipole moment induced dipole moment that can be related to alpha into E alpha is the polarized polarizability and E is this E 0 cos of this. So, for small amplitude of vibration the polarizability alpha is linear function of q as you can see. So, therefore, we can write down alpha is equal to alpha 0 al d al alpha by d q into q and ignoring the higher order terms. So, p can be related to this way alpha 0 a 0 you can see you can plug in this one and a big equation. And then finally, after solving all these equations which I have done here in the slide you can get elastic scattering given by this and elastic scattering is given by this. In the elastic scattering part you can always get mu 0 minus mu uh, m or mu 1 mu 0 plus mu m. So, this is basically Stokes, this is anti Stokes. These two are the factors which are responsible for the Raman scattering. So, by just putting a this is simple molecular structure and then one radiations, we can always calculate the polarization or induced dipole moment, and we can see dipole moment can uh, calculation can lead to us this kind of mathematical theory. So, therefore, if I want to give you some example. Like suppose for carbon dioxide here you have C C C O O molecule Q plus Q 0 Q ok. So, you can see that this is what is this uh, you know there is no displacement here there is a positive displacement there is a negative displacement here Q you remember. So, if I write mu 1 versus Q space that is what will give. So, there is this is the polarizability so there is a polarizability change this is be Raman active, but on the other hand if there is no probability change this is the band in which it happens that this will be IR active which will be not be Raman active. If the molecule is stretched or change this configuration this way this will also be the IR active this can also show you the change in the frequency as function of cube. So, finally, again I have put down these equations where the Rayleigh the elastic scattering and elastic scattering events are both are given. One can do it for other molecules like water you can see all the modes are in water actually nu 1, nu 2, nu 3 are active in Raman and this because this leads to change in polarity and change in uh, the polarizations both. If you take CH 2 Cl 2 
there are stretching and bending both possible here. So, if I consider V s this is this is the stretching bands for this or V a P or V s here actually there are 3 a 1 B 1 A 1. So, that you know change in the stretching can lead to scattering or you can have a bending actually you can see that this is scissoring you can have scissoring this is all we discussed in, in the IS spectroscopy or you can have a rocking or wagging or twisting this vibrations can lead to Raman active spectrum. So, to give you little more aspects of the polarizability if you have not understood much so that you can go back and look at the slides. Polarizability of molecule is it to the mobility of the electrons when you apply field basically you apply field how the electrons move they move symmetrically then there is no change of polarizability if they move and distortion happens in the field direction of the field okay. and then it is anisotropic but if suppose distortion is same this is isotropic. So, more molecules for many molecules polarity depends on the direction of the applied fields. So, direction of the applied fields like H H easier to distort along the bonds than perpendicular to the bond. So, polarity is anisotropic. Variation of the alpha with direction is described by polarity tensor. A tensor is another you know uh, vector which can be used to detect uh, to basically show the variation of alpha with the direction. Now, vibration is active it is if it has a change in polarity any vibrations in the molecule if you put an energy will be active Raman active if there is a change in the polarity alpha. So, basically I can tell this way polarity is ease of distortion of the bond. So, therefore, for Raman active vibrations incident radiation does not cause a change in the dipole moment of the molecule, but it change the polarity of the molecule that means it change the electronic distortion of the molecule it does not really change the basically dipole moment that the molecule the, the dipoles are not going apart the strengths are not changing, but their plausibility means strength of this electronic the uh, no mobility of the electrons are getting distorted or changed. So, the starting vibration going the electric field of the radiation at time t is induced the separation of charges as you at the beginning you put electric field it induces separate some charges and then this is called basically dipole moment which can be related to this p into alpha and v remember alpha is basically the polarizability. So, we are talking about this change of alpha not change of p which is required for Raman change of p is required for the IR. Please do not get confused with the molecules dipole moment or the change in dipole moment because this is always often gets to be 0 for the molecule of these molecules. Again, I come back to CH2 Cl2 okay. So, uh, sorry I come back to this is wrong I come back to CO2 there are 4 modes of CO2 and only for out of 4 only new one is Raman active. So, new one is this one CCO. So, there is a change in you can see dipole moment this change is there is not 0 mu 3 and mu 4 basically 2 or 4 they are higher active. So, here mu is the dipole moment nu actually alpha is polarizability q is the vibration coordinate r is basically q is this basically the displacement which we have used that and this is what you can show this is nu 1. So, you can see polarizability is changing like this this is mu 3 polarizability is changing very small not active, but polarization is dipole moment is changing extensively here dipole moment does not get changed. To give another example of benzene actually benzene as you know this is as aromatic CH ring and this is a stretch band at about close to 3000 actually and then you have a ring breathing mode which is about 992 and Raman this is the basically Raman ships you can see these are the Raman ships and this is the basically absolute CM Raman shift is calculated in by difference between the incident radiation and the and the vibration which is coming out and this is what is the breathing mode and this is what is stretching mode can be calculated. Now, to show you the difference between infrared and the Raman I take this complex molecule with NH2 groups. So, you can see that Raman shifts gives you very nice spectra as compared to the IR and Raman shifts comes at a higher delta mu than or mu actually uh, this is Raman shift actually change in frequency change in wave number this is a mu 
and this is continuous here, this is the basically fingerprint regions here in IR, but the most important things comes in this higher uh, uh, change in the wave number regions. So, this is again shown here, this is the 50 IR, this is IR uh, Raman, I can see that uh, COCO is same, but CC this one is highly increased for Raman and we can get other peaks also which is very similar in this case of molecule. This again obtained from McCree's book. To uh, give you a list of the Raman and the higher frequency for different functional groups, alkanes, this, this is very strong in higher, Raman is also very strong. CC stage obviously is Raman is uh, strong, but higher is not uh, at all available. And then there are others C triple bonds, C n you can see strong and very strong Raman scattering. Then you have very strong I S scattering for primary these bonds, but weak Raman scattering and very strong Raman scattering also come for C S stress because there are a lot of change of polarity of the uh, molecule. This is all obtained from McCree's book. Well, there is another thing which you know we should also know for Raman scattering is the radiation power or radiant power. As you see the radiant power phi r is proportional to sigma v x, v x to the power nu x sorry sigma nu x, nu x to the power 4 e 0 a 9 e to the power minus e i by k t, where sigma e nu x is basically Raman scattering cross section which is in terms of centimeter square and nu x the excitation frequency by which you are putting the energy, laser beam energy. E 0 is the incident beam in radiance, nu n i is the number of density states in any state i and E i is the energy of the states and uh, this is basically exponential term comes because of Boltzmann's. So, this sigma term is target area presented by molecule for scattering that is what is this scattering cross section. How much is that area target area by molecule for scattering event to occur. So, that can be also you know put it in it this way. So, as you see sigma is basically this sigma capital sigma sigma by this this is the scattering cross integration of the whole scattering for the molecule and d sigma by sigma d sigma means this is small sigma this is capital sigma is nothing but scatter flux by unit solid angle divided by incident flux this is c incident flux by unit solid angle. So, scattering by incident and then you multiply the whole solid angle which is coming out and you get that. So, if I have to uh, compare this with other techniques like uh, UV, IR, flow sense, Rayleigh, Raman and other surface enhanced Raman. You can see the scattering cross section is very high, very high means not very high, 10 to the minus 18 is pretty low, but still it is high in case of UV and IR. Rayleigh and Raman it is pretty low, 10 to the minus 26, minus 29. That is the problem actually Raman spectroscopy, you need to have a very good detector to detect this scattering. Threats. Again uh, for uh, excitations I am giving you some values for uh, CH3CL, okay, you can see that these are the wavelengths, excitation wavelengths, these are the sigma values all in the range of 10 to the minus 20 centimeter square. These are all uh, uh, adopted from Acora's book of surface enhanced vibrational spectroscopy. Now lastly which we are going to talk about is the typical Raman setup or things how it is done in the lab scale. As you can see this is very complex first part of this most important part of this monochromaton spectrograph and then you have a laser beam which is source which is basically passes to dielectric mirrors then put the sample then its radiation is collected or the scattering events are collected it is you can see that it is false and then does not grow like this, but it comes back at a scattering angle collected by collecting lens focusing lens analyzer then polarization scambler and then it goes to this in slits and then monochromata things. In this part of this monochromata you have several important aspects. One is the controller, second one is the photon counter, photon can, can be counted by PMT photo multiplier tube and then you have a controller which will plot this display this data and then you have a display. So, that is what is the basically I think I have already discussed with you about monochromata, monochromata are uh, uh, in case of uh, photolumination spectroscopy. So, uh, the spectrograph is where the data are plotted. So, scattering can be done in both ways from the laser light can fall and scattering can happen either 90 degree this way or you can have 180 degree coming and scattered and then false scattering falls on the lens and again this is focused and then they are collected. This is what is shown here 
collecting lens focusing lens analyzer and this then it enters the monochromator. You can spectrograph, spectrographs can be diff, uh, for Raman's actually this is for this uh, A 1877 triple monochromator uh, the whole thing is uh, basically monochromator uh, this is the uh, specs 1303 double monochromator. Let us look at first the double monochromator. So, you can clearly see that these are these beam splitters or mirrors actually it falls comes and falls on a mirror M5 sorry it falls on M1 then goes on to G1 then again M2 uh, gets reflected finally it comes out through this. So, entrance and this from the entrance and the uh, exit there are actually 1 M1 to M5 there are 5 mirrors and there are this splitters G1, G2 and they are all actually and uh, the by this way you can actually get this monochromatic um, radiations and otherwise you can do what you can do is this way you can have entrance then it passes through lot of bands passes finally it goes to the subtractive dispersion and it falls on a 3 turret getting assembly and then comes out. Well we will not discuss so much of detail but there are two types of spectrographs used one is a double monochromator type one is triple monochromator depending on this has a better ability to collect data than, than this one. Otherwise you can use photo detectors and actually nowadays people use photo detectors because these are easy to manipulate and easy to work with. Photo detector is nothing but basically you have you can see here you have photo cathode with a f and then you have a uh, within that you have electronic intensifier which will intensify and then these are actually cooler cold finger which will be cooling it and you have optical fiber coupler which will couple that. And uh, you can always use otherwise CCD, CCD cameras or charge coupled device where you can actually have pixel types in which you can detect radiations coming on each pixel. So and what about others in this case water can be used as a solvent and very suitable for biological samples. We know in IR we cannot use water as a solvent it can absorb and then because water can be used this is very easy biological samples can be done. Raman spectra results from a molecular vibration of at fire frequencies spectrums are obtained using visible lights or you can add near IR radiations. Glass or quartz lenses cells optical fibers can be used standard detectors always used but nowadays no longer. Few intense overtones and combination bands like few spectral overlaps can be done you can totally symmetric vibrations are observable. Raman's intensities are basically proportional to concentration and the laser power this is the proportionality constant not alpha. Well as you have seen that this is much more simpler and cheaper than the IR spectroscopy it has experimentation uh, instrumentation is much less uh, but the lower detection limit is the problem in case of Raman. So background flow sense can always propagate problem for Raman which you will see how to take care and more suitable for vibration with bonds with low polarizability like chlorine carbon fluorine bonds. So how to take care of this uh, you know, background so if you suppose take with water and cuvette this spectra and then separately you can take for water and cuvette without sample for sample here is basically sodium sulphate and then you can basically subtract and get this uh, background removed that is what is can be done routinely nowadays for the computers. Applications Raman spectra can be used for many many uh, applications like molecular vibrations or quantity quality analysis also it can be done for all kinds of elements sort many uh, range solids stress measurements high pressure and glasses also there are large number of applications. So with this I close this chapter on Raman spectroscopy the only thing which is left over is the stem yields energy loss spectroscopy which we will discuss in the next two classes.